Reprogramming now for live coverage of the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee. They're continuing to look at the current problems in the financial markets. Today's hearing will focus on the regulation of hedge funds. George Soros is among the witnesses. You'll also hear from former SEC Chairman David Reuter. Congressman Henry Waxman chairs this committee. A programming note will return to our historical programming on Senator Joseph McCarthy immediately after this hearing ends. The collapse of Lehman Brothers and AIG. We learned that these companies took on massive risk. When the bottom fell out, senior management walked away with millions of dollars, while shareholders and taxpayers lost billions. Our third hearing focused on the role of the credit rating agencies. At that hearing, we learned about the colossal failures of these gatekeepers of the financial markets. As one internal document said, quote, we sold our soul to the devil for revenue, end quote. At our fourth hearing, we examined the role of financial regulators. Former Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan told us that he had, had identified a flaw in the deregulatory ideology he had championed. Today's hearing has a different focus. The five hedge fund managers who will testify today have had unimaginable success in the financial markets. Although there is a variation on how much uh, they made individually, on average, our witnesses made over $1 billion a year. That's on average, $1 billion a year. There are two reasons we have invited these hedge fund managers to testify. First, these are some of the most successful and knowledgeable investors in our financial mar markets. They each have valuable perspectives to share about what has gone wrong and what steps we need to restore our financial system. Second, their testimony and the testimony of the independent experts on our first panel will help the committee to examine three important issues. What role have hedge funds played in our current financial crisis? Do hedge funds pose a systemic risk to our financial system? And what level of government oversight and regulation is appropriate? Currently, hedge funds are virtually unregulated. They are not required to report information on their holdings, their leverage, or their strategies. Regulators aren't even certain how many hedge funds exist and how much money they, can, they control. We do know, however, that hedge funds are growing rapidly and becoming increasingly important players in the financial markets. Over the last decade, their holding, holdings reportedly have increased over fivefold to more than $2 trillion. We also know that some hedge funds are highly leveraged. They invest in assets that are illiquid and difficult to price and sell rapidly. And we know from our hearings into Lehman and AIG, uh, combining these factors can cause financial institutions uh, to blow up. And we'll hear today some experts uh, we'll hear today some experts worry that the failure of large hedge funds could pose a significant systemic risk to our financial system. We also know that hedge funds can receive special tax breaks. The five witnesses we'll hear from today earned on average of a billion dollars last year, yet the tax law allows them to treat the vast majority of their earnings as capital gains. That means that at least some portion of their earnings could be taxed at rates as low as 15 percent. That's a lower tax rate than many school teachers, firefighters, or even plumbers pay. In our, hearing, in our prior hearings, we have focused on what went wrong in the past. Today's hearing lets us ask what could go wrong in the future so we can prevent damage before it occurs. Both types of hearings are essential. We need to understand both what happened and what could happen in order to solve the immense e economic problems we are facing. I want to thank all of our witnesses for appearing today. Uh, some of the uh, witnesses readjusted their schedules to testify. They all responded to our request for documents, and I appreciate their cooperation and look forward to their testimony. I want to uh, now uh, call on uh, Ranking Member Tom Davis for an opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for calling the hearing today.
Uh, hedge fund losses and in some cases complete liquidations are an effect of the current financial crisis. It is unlikely they are the cause. The real origin of this market contraction is the continuing collapse of the U.S. housing market, triggered and fueled by preposterously lax lending standards, loose management, aggressive lobbying and lavish perks, some at the quasi-governmental giants that dominated the market, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Uh, they helped to create and enhance the ravenous hunger for mortgage-backed securities, credit default swaps and other highly sophisticated byproducts of the housing boom that drew hedge funds into the abyss. As a result, hedge fund redemptions of stocks and other assets will continue to put downward pressure on the market. It wasn't supposed to be this way. Billed as purely private gambles by sophisticated investors, hedge funds now pose very public peril when the bets go bad. Designed as a strategy to reduce investment risk, hedge funds now compound risk when complex deals start to unravel and throw off unintended consequences. And powered by sophisticated computer models, hedge fund trading was meant to capitalize on, not cause, global market shifts. But now, due to their size and speed, hedge funds often accelerate wild market fluctuations. So when these unregulated private funds become a public problem, many see a need for greater transparency in their operations and tighter regulation on some hedge fund activities. Greater standardization, registration, disclosure, and some regulatory limitations could help the industry mature and survive. Remember, the automobiles started out as a purely private, wholly unregulated mode of transportation. But when widespread use of the new and powerful machines began to pose public safety issues, it became necessary to decide as a matter of public policy who was qualified to operate a motor vehicle, how fast they could go, where they could go. Well, we seem to be at the same crossroads for hedge funds. With as many as 8,000 funds managing up to $1.5 trillion, hedge funds are said to account for 20 to 30 percent of trading volume in the United States, in U.S. stocks. They may handle even higher levels of transactions involving more specialized instruments such as convertible bonds and credit derivatives. Their trades can move markets. So this isn't just about sophisticated high-stakes investors anymore. Institutional funds and public pensions now have a huge stake in hedge funds' promises of steady, above-market returns. That means public employees and middle-income senior citizens, not just Tom Wolfe's Masters of the Universe, lose money when hedge funds decline or collapse altogether. Brittle complexity, huge transactions on computerized autopilot, and other structural inadequacies make hedge funds particularly, sometimes spectacularly, vulnerable to financial contagion the downward spiral of lost value, margin calls and redemptions in the desperate search for cash. It is clear investors and regulators need to know more about fund investment strategies, leverage levels and redemption terms to reduce their systematic risk posed by hedge funds. The hedge fund business model may become a casualty of the downturn or it will adopt to new global realities. Going forward, hedge funds will have to take account of a reduced tolerance by investors and governments for an unregulated parallel financial universe of exotic derivatives run by faceless quants that exerts unpredictable gravitational forces on the open marketplace. But again, we need to remember in the larger implosion of the housing market, hedge funds are collateral damage. We should avoid Congress's natural tendency to overreact and bayonet the wounded. Today's witnesses bring extensive expertise and experience to our discussion of hedge funds in the current financial crisis. We appreciate their testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. I would like to introduce the four members of our first panel. Professor David Ruder is a professor at Northwestern University's School of Law and served as chairman of the SEC under President Reagan from 1987 to 1989. Professor Andrew Lowe is director of the Laboratory for Financial Engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's Sloan School of Management. Professor Joseph Bankman is the Ralph M. Parsons Professor of Law and Business at Stanford Law School. And Mr. Homan Shadab is a senior research fellow from the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. I thank each of you for being here. It is the practice of this committee that all witnesses testify under oath. So I would like to ask if you would you please stand and raise your right hands. Uh, do you solemnly swear the testimony you will give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. The uh, record will indicate that each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative.
Uh, you have prepared uh, uh, statements for the, and we will insert your complete statements in the record. What we'd like to ask each of you to do is to try to limit the oral presentation to around five minutes. We won't be, uh, we won't bang you out of order after five minutes. But there is a clock uh, that will be green for four minutes, um, orange for the last one minute, and then it will turn red. And when you see that it's red, we would like you to then consider wrapping up the. Uh, uh, the presentation to us. Uh, Professor Reuter, there's a button on the base of the mic. I'd like to ask you to press it in and pull it close enough to you so that it will pick up everything you have to say. But we're pleased to hear from you first. Uh, Chairman Waxman, Congressman Davis, and committee members, I'm pleased to be here today. Uh, hedge funds are risk takers. They seek greater than market returns by identifying price ano pricing anomalies, by engaging in hedging strategies, by using leverage and by investing in derivative instruments. Hedge fund investments and hedging activities make positive contributions to capital formation, market liquidity, price discovery, and market efficiency. Hedge funds, however, may pose risks to investors and to the financial markets. They pose risks to their investors because they may suffer substantial losses, may not be able to repay investors in times of stress, or may simply dissolve without returning any monies to their investors. Dishonest hedge funds may injure investors by making misrepresentations when they sell fund securities, falsifying operating and valuation results, or by stealing fund assets. Hedge funds can create negative results to the financial system when their losses cause them to liquidate market positions, resulting in downward pressures on the asset classes they are selling. Their defaults may cause losses to their counterparties. This danger was dramatically illustrated in 1998 at the time of the collapse of long-term capital management when the implosion of one major hedge fund caused tremendous disruptions in the financial markets. Although hedge funds have been active participants in the derivative and stock markets, they do not seem to have played a major causal role in the events precipitating the credit market crisis. Nevertheless, Hedge funds that have suffered major losses have contributed to declines in stock and asset prices by liquidating assets in order to meet other obligations and in order to pay investors seeking to withdraw funds. Some hedge fund advisors are registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission under the Investment Advisors Act of 1940. Under that act, the Commission has power to inspect hedge fund advisors for compliance with federal securities laws. In 2004, the SEC sought the power to inspect all hedge fund advisors, but lost a court case overturning the rule it adopted. Following that decision, the SEC adopted a rule giving it strong powers to bring enforcement actions against hedge fund advisors, whether registered or unregistered, who defraud investors. Nevertheless, the SEC still does not have the power to inspect unregistered hedge fund advisors. A primary problem identified in the credit crisis has been the loss of confidence among market participants regarding the ability of counterparties to honor contractual obligations and to repay their debts. The main reason for this lack of confidence is lack of information. Despite the fact that hedge funds were not the primary actors in causing the credit crisis, I believe that the Securities and Exchange Commission should be given power to register and inspect all hedge funds. It should have power to require hedge fund advisors to disclose the size and nature of hedge fund risk positions and the identities of their counterparties. It should have the power to monitor and assess the effectiveness of hedge fund risk management systems. Information the SEC receives, receives should be shared on a confidential basis with the Federal Reserve Board as the federal agency with primary responsibility for systemic risk regulation. Although these new regu regulatory powers are important, it is not desirable to impose regulation on hedge fund risk activities, including use of leverage and derivative instruments. Hedge funds should not be regulated in a matter that stifles their innovative financial market activities. The SEC is the proper entity to obtain hedge fund risk information and to monitor and assess the effectiveness of hedge fund risk management systems. The SEC understands the financial markets and the need to allow innovative risk taking. If the SEC is charged with increased inspection 
risk monitoring and risk assessment responsibilities, it will need substantial additional funding. These new responsibilities would, would require increased numbers of SEC staff who can understand and evaluate the complicated hedge fund environment. Hedge funds are major users of non-exchange traded derivative instruments. A tremendous void exists regarding the specific characteristics of many of these instruments, the amounts at risks, and the identity of counterparties. The terms of these instruments are often unique and complicated. As a second method, method of addressing the opacity and impact of derivative instruments in our final mark, financial markets, I believe that the swaps exclusion included in the Commodity Futures Modernization Act of 2000 should be repealed so that trading in these non-exchange derivative instruments can be regulated. Some of the current uncertainties relating to derivative instruments can be overcome by standardizing terms and causing the instruments to be traded and settled on futures or options exchanges. I understand that efforts are currently underway to provide a platform uh, for settling these instruments. Thank you for the opportunity to express my views on these important matters. Thank you very much, Professor Love. Chairman Waxman, Ranking Minority Member Davis, and other members of the House Oversight Committee, thank you for inviting me to testify today at uh, this hearing on hedge funds. In the interest of full disclosure, I'd like to inform the committee that in addition to my faculty position at MIT, I'm also affiliated with an asset management company that manages several hedge funds and mutual funds. I realize that the committee has a number of questions for the panel, so I'll keep my introductory remarks brief. Over the past 10 years, much of my research at MIT has been focused on hedge fund, on hedge fund industry. Part of that research has been devoted specifically to Madam hedge Chair, funds. Madam we have the witness risk. either, uh, I'm not sure if your mic is on or you're not close enough to it. Sorry. Thank, no problem. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it used to be the case that systemic risk was the exclusive domain of central bankers, macroeconomists, regulators, and finance professors had little to do with the subject. But the events of August 1998, the collapse of LTCM and other hedge funds that year, showed pretty clearly that the hedge fund industry does have an impact on what we think of as systemic risk. Since then, the hedge fund industry has grown even bigger, and it's become even more important to the growth and operations of the global economy. And that's no exaggeration. Hedge funds control approximately $1.5 trillion of capital, but which is more like $3 trillion with leverage. Now, that's come down quite a bit from just a year ago when it was $2 trillion of assets and $5.5 trillion with leverage. And this decline is likely to imply uh, several thousand hedge funds going under between the years of 2007 to 2009. Hedge funds are now involved in virtually every aspect of economic activity, investing in every kind of market and asset, making loans for all purposes, including mortgages engaging in market-making activity, financing bridges, highways, tunnels, and other infrastructure in many countries, and even providing insurance. It's the hedge fund's ubiquity, size, leverage, illiquidity, and lack of transparency that creates systemic risk for the financial system. Hedge funds now provide many of the same services as banks. But unlike banks, hedge funds are not regulated. They're outside the Federal Reserve System, which you may recall was originally set up to deal with systemic risk in the banking industry. Like banks, hedge funds provide liquidity, but unlike banks, they can withdraw that liquidity from the marketplace at a moment's notice. Like banks, hedge funds use leverage, but unlike banks, they face no limits other than those imposed by their prime brokers and counterparties, nor do they face any capital adequacy requirements, which means that hedge funds can get wiped out completely. Uh, but of course, investors are prepared for that. And when hedge funds were a cottage industry consisting of small boutiques, that wasn't a problem. In fact, that was very positive for the economy because there are some risks that only hedge funds are willing to bear. But when hedge funds become too big to fail, that poses a problem for the financial system. As the hedge fund industry has grown, so too has its contribution to systemic risk. And as early as 2004, my co-authors and I uncovered indirect evidence for increasing levels of systemic risk in the industry due to apparent increases in assets under management, leverage, illiquidity, and correlations among hedge funds in commercially available databases. And I realize that this hearing is about hedge funds, so that's been the focus of my comments and my written testimony. But in the interest of fairness, I should point out that 
While hedge funds have taken on many of the same functions as banks over the last decade, thanks to the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act in 1999, many banks have now become more like hedge funds. And over the past decade, commercial banks, investment banks, and hedge funds have been locked in heated competition with each other, all fueled by investors, including pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, and government-sponsored enterprises, seeking that extra bit of yield in a frustratingly low-yield environment. This economic free-for-all between banks, hedge funds, government-sponsored entities, and Wall Street is one of the main, main reasons for the magnitude of the current financial crisis. In my written testimony, I provide several concrete proposals for addressing these issues, but let me mention two that pertain specifically to hedge funds. While I've written about the possibility of systemic shocks emanating from the hedge fund industry, the fact is that we cannot come to any firm conclusions because we simply don't have the data. Hedge funds don't have to report their monthly returns to any regulatory authority, much less details about their risk exposures. So my first proposal is to require all hedge funds or their prime brokers to provide certain risk measures to regulators periodically and on a confidential basis. And I give examples in my written testimony of the types of risk measures that would be most useful from the systemic perspective. My second proposal is to create an investigative office like the National Transportation Safety Board to examine every single financial blow-up, not just the headline grabbers, and to produce publicly accessible reports on what happened, how it happened, why it happened, who caused it to happen, and how to keep it from happening again. With greater transparency into the hedge fund industry and a better understanding of blow-ups that contribute most to systemic risk, both the public and the private sectors will be much better prepared to handle any financial crisis now or in the future. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, uh, Chair Wax, Waxman, Ranking Member Davis, members of the committee, thank you very much for asking me to come here to testify. The views I express are my own and are not necessarily shared by Stanford University. I have been asked to pri provide an overview of hedge fund taxation, focusing on some of the benefits of hedge fund managers. Uh, my testimony, however, will uh, also include uh, private equity fund compensation agreements and tax benefits since they are quite similar. Managers in both these fields receive a management fee, typically set at 2 percent of the amount under management. They also receive a profits interest, typically set at 20 percent of the fund's profits. The profits interest is sometimes called a carried interest or simply a carry. The management fee is taxed as ordinary income. The profits interest is taxed as capital gain if and to the extent the fund fund itself is recognizing capital gain. If it is long-term capital gain, uh, that is at a tax rate of 15 percent as opposed to the 35 percent maximum tax rate on ordinary income. In addition, carry is exempt from payroll tax. The benefits of this treatment have been estimated at over $30 billion over the next 10 years. However, as I note in my written testimony, most of the benefits of tre this treatment probably accrue to the private equity side of the ledger rather than the hedge fund uh, side of the ledger. Uh, that said, the uh, hedge fund and private equity industries to some extent overlap. Hedge fund managers do benefit from this preference and change in trading strategies might make this preference even more important in the future. In my written testimony, I express my belief and I believe the belief uh, of an overwhelming majority of my colleagues and tax scholars uh, that this preference is uh, misguided. The way to think about it is to think of the choice our sons and daughters face when they decide upon a career. Uh, if they are uh, smart and ambitious, they might become doctors or scientists or lawyers. Uh, these occupations and countless other occupations are going to produce income that is taxed at ordinary income rates. Alternatively, they could go into the fund industry and recognize some and in some cases most of their income at capital gain rates. That is simply unfair. It violates the common sense maximum that if you have two people earning the same amount, you ought to tax them at the same rate. It is also inefficient. It reduces the size of our economic pie by distorting the career choice our sons and daughters are going to make. It is sometimes argued that uh, hedge fund managers ought to be uh, and private equity managers ought to be compared to entrepreneurs. As I mentioned in my written testimony, I don't think that comparison is apt. Hedge fund managers uh, are more similar, I think, to investment bankers or to executives at public companies, uh, all of whom recognize income at ordinary income rates. There are other arguments made in defense of the current tax treatment. It said, for example, that this is recompense for the risk uh, fund managers 
others take, that it is a good way to favor certain industries or to subsidize investment in general. As I note in my written testimony, I believe all those arguments are incorrect. I would be happy uh, uh, to discuss that uh, with the uh, members uh, uh, in question, uh, period. The capital gain preference isn't the only tax preference uh, hedge fund uh, managers receive. They've been able to defer recognition of gain, to refer tax on their management fees simply by leaving those fees in the fund, and they've also been able to defer tax on the income those fees have generated. Tax applies only when the managers have decided uh, at their election to withdraw the money from the fund. Uh, the value of this benefit has been estimated at about $20 billion over 10 years. Years. Uh, this last benefit, the deferral of fees, it might be of interest for the committee in dis discussing the relevant benefits and burdens of uh, government regulations and uh, tax on the industry. It is not, however, something of current interest in terms of legislation since under the Economic uh, Stabilization Act it is scheduled to end at the end of this year. However, the tax benefits of carry uh, still remain. Uh, the House has voted in June to tax all uh, carry at ordinary income rates. That was a measure I supported. Unfortunately, it died in the Senate. Uh, I'm hopeful that the members here and the House in general will again reenact that measure. In my written testimony, I suggest that uh, the, the drafters look at the remarks of the New York State Bar Association as to how to draft that provision, and hopefully this time it will make it through the Senate and become law. Thank you. Chairman, Ranking Member Davis, and distinguished members of the committee. It is an honor to testify in this forum today about the relationship between hedge funds and the financial crisis, and I am privileged to join such a dis distinguished panel. My name is Human Shadab, and I am a Senior Research Fellow at the Mercatus Center, and a participating scholar in the Center's Financial Markets Working Group. The Mercatus Center is a university-based education, outreach, and research organization affiliated with George Mason University. My own research focuses on financial regulation. I was asked to testify today on certain aspects of the role of hedge funds in the financial crisis. I also have submitted written testimony, which provides more detail and background. There are three important findings I would like to share with the committee. First, hedge funds did not cause the financial crisis and are in fact helping to reduce its damage and save taxpayers money. This may seem surprising, but in fact hedge funds have, ex have historically made markets more stable and have helped their investors conserve wealth in times of economic stress. In other words, hedge funds are often less risky than mutual funds. A typical hedge fund strategy seeks to achieve higher risk-adjusted returns, but not necessarily higher returns in other investment vehicles. And in fact, throughout this crisis, hedge funds have conserved wealth much better than mutual funds have. Second, short selling by hedge funds has helped draw attention to the poor investment choices made by financial companies in recent years, but did not cause them to collapse. When hedge funds short sell the stocks of unhealthy companies, they help to divert capital from companies that are fundamentally unstable. This not only prevents stock market bubbles from becoming worse, but it helps to ensure that companies that are making good decisions are rewarded and are better able to provide stable, long-term jobs for their employees. Third, existing laws and regulations should be strictly enforced against hedge funds and their managers, and these include laws prohibiting fraud, insider trading, abusive short selling, and, and other types of market manipulation. But changing how hedge funds are regulated could actually undermine the interests of investors and heighten economic instability. While it may be easy to lump hedge funds together with the financial institutions that were directly involved with this crisis, we must be very careful to make the appropriate distinctions to ensure that policy responses to the crisis do not undermine the ability of the economy to recover. So what is a hedge fund? A hedge fund is a private investment company that makes frequent trades in stocks and other financial instruments and compensates its manager in part with an annual performance-based fee, typically 20 percent of profits. Hedge fund managers also typically invest in the funds they manage. This compensation agreement leads hedge fund managers to strike a relatively healthy balance between risk taking and risk management. And as empirical research has found, to make the survival of the hedge fund a greater priority than earning performance fees. Now, it may come as a surprise to some, but hedge funds are not even actually a part of corporate America. Hedge funds often take aggressive action against company executives they think are paid too much or are not properly running their companies. 
Importantly, when hedge funds get other companies to more properly manage their businesses, hedge funds help those other companies provide more stable jobs for their employees. Now, the financial crisis is the result of distortions in the mortgage and banking sectors and would have happened even if hedge funds had never existed. Indeed, hedge funds were never the major purchasers of mortgage-related securities. The, merger, the major purchasers were banks, insurance companies, pensions, and mutual funds. The most meaningful role hedge funds have played during the financial crisis has actually been to dampen its cost to the economy. Large numbers of, of hedge funds, worth a total of approximately $100 billion, have increasingly been, performing, been purchasing poorly performing assets, such as mortgage-backed securities, and are helping to reduce the need for economic bailouts funded by taxpayers. Indeed, just yesterday, the Treasury Department announced that it may start requiring companies that receive government funds to first, to first raise private capital. Many hedge funds may be poised to provide such capital, as a recent estimate found that the hedge funds are currently holding about $400 billion in cash. Given the massive losses that have resulted from the financial crisis, our system of financial regulation certainly needs rethinking. Yet based upon the empirical evidence, changing the already substantial body of law applicable to hedge funds will not stop this crisis or prevent another one from happening. Instead, lawmakers and regulators should focus on two things. First, economic recovery may take place more quickly if lawmakers make it easier for hedge funds and other private investment funds to invest in banks. Second, lawmakers and regulators may want to take a look at making it easier for ordinary investors to have access to the investment strategies offered by hedge funds. For example, reducing the restrictions on mutual funds investment activities may be a way for all investors to benefit from the protection that hedge funds provide and not just the rich ones. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share my research with the committee. Thank uh, all the panelists for your testimony. The chair recognizes herself for five minutes. The, the current um, financial crisis started over a year ago with the collapse of the subprime market. Through our hearings, we've learned about the roles of lenders, bankers, brokers, and credit rating agencies. One question that I have is how hedge funds may have affected and contributed to this crisis. Since September, hedge funds have faced a massive increase in withdrawals from their investors. According to one report, they have faced redemptions of over $50 billion. As a result, many have been forced to sell assets to raise cash. The hedge funds are selling into a down market, and this further drives down stock prices. Bloomberg News described this cycle recently as, and I quote, downdraft of market declines, client redemptions, demands from lenders for more collateral, and forced asset sales, end quote. Professor Rudder, in, in your testimony, you stated that hedge funds have contributed to the decline in stock and asset prices by liquidating stocks and other assets in order to meet other obligations and in order to pay investors seeking to withdraw funds. Is it your view uh, that these hedge fund withdrawals are affecting the broader market? Uh, indeed they are. Uh, this hedge funds, uh, uh, at least by all reports, are selling uh, massive amounts into the uh, stock markets, causing the stock markets to, re to, to de assisting in the stock market decline. We don't know uh, how much uh, they have contributed to declines in other assets, but uh, surely they are engaged in sales of those assets as well. Uh, I, I know it's happening. I regard that aspect of it to be a rather natural effect coming from the credit crisis itself. And Pro Professor Lowe, what is your view? Uh, <clears throat> I agree with Professor Ruder that uh, there is certainly uh, an effect of hedge funds uh, unwinding their positions on the marketplace. However, those effects are the unavoidable aspects of a free capital uh, market and something that while we need to be aware of and we need to prepare for, it may not require any direct oversight. Okay. Market analyst uh, Jeff Bagley has estimated that hedge funds might be forced to sell half a trillion dollars worth of assets as a result of this uh, financial crisis. And, and Professor Lowe or Professor Rudder, what would be the impact of forced sales like this? Well, it's clear that, the, that forced sales will affect the markets. Uh, what we need to know in advance is what are these positions so that the financial regulators can have some way uh, 
mm -hmm. of, uh, of attacking the problem of the massive uh, uh, amounts of, of monies that are held by hedge funds. So there is a definite need for more transparency. I uh, certainly agree with that. And, and Professor Lowe, a recent report by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development found that hedge funds had purchased over 70 percent of the riskiest tranches of collateral, collateralized debt obligations, uh, the financial in instruments used to sell the subprime mortgages to investors that are at the root of this crisis before us. What impacts did these investments have on the financial crisis, and did hedge funds facilitate the growth of the market for the sale of these toxic uh, CDOs? Well, certainly I think they, um, uh, they did facilitate <coughs> the growth of these markets by taking on the capacity for holding these so-called uh, toxic waste uh, tranches. Uh, however, that again has both a uh, positive and a negative. The positive is that there are few other investors in the economy that are willing to take such risks, and so hedge funds provide a valuable service. However, on the downside, when, uh, when these uh, particular risky assets end up losing great sums of money, hedge funds are under, put under great stress and the unwinding of these portfolios can create a significant market dislocation. Long-term uh, capital management, uh, a hedge fund uh, failed uh, in 1998 and uh, the Federal Reserve was so concerned about market turmoil that they organized investment bankers to to come in and to really be supportive and, and to put them uh, uh, back on a, a sound financial footing. What concerns me now is there are no investment banks left to buy up hedge funds if they fail and are causing uh, systemic risk in our financial markets. And would anyone like to comment on that? Yes, well, Professor Lowe. I, yes, I, mm -hmm. uh, I agree that uh, this is a significant issue, which is one of the reasons that in my written testimony I call for further transparency uh, into the so-called shadow banking system. Uh, it's not at all clear that we need more regulation. I think it is clear that we need more effective regulation, but it's difficult for us to, to propose what that effective regulation looks like unless we have more transparency into uh, the, uh, the hedge fund uh, mm -hmm. industry. With that additional uh, transparency, we can develop a sense of what exactly is needed. Th thank you very much. And I recognize uh, Ranking Member Davis for five minutes. Well, thank you. Um, <coughs> uh, thank you very much, Ms. Morning. Um, do all of you believe that hedge funds are adequately regulated? And could you also comment on the adequacy of the disclosure requirements for these entities? I know you touched on it in your statements, but I just well, I, I would be pleased to expand on that, uh, uh, Congressman Davis. Uh, there, there ought to be some way in which the aggregate risk positions of the hedge funds and the risk positions of their counterparties are revealed to a central regulator. I don't really know what the central regulator will do, but it is impossible for that central regulator to take adequate steps to forestall calamities without having that information. So the first step has to be an inspection system, an assessment system, and as my prepared testimony says, I think that uh, the SEC should, or someone like the SEC, should have uh, an opportunity to, to look at the risk management systems of the hedge funds in order to see that they are not engaged in steps which are going to create the kinds of calamities we have had. Professor Long. Well, Congressman Davis, I, I think that uh, the, uh, the, the possibility of legislating losses away is obviously uh, impossible and unwise. Uh, dislocation comes not from losing money, but from the wrong investors losing money. And if we provide greater transparency to the marketplace, I believe that a great deal of the problems that we have been facing will take care of themselves to a large degree. However, there is no mechanism currently for that information to be uh, provided to the public or to regulators. So I agree with Professor Reuter that we do need to have a mechanism for providing that level of transparency. Beyond that, I think it is very premature to be able to say what kind of regulations should be imposed. Thank you. Professor Bankman? Yeah. You want to oh, uh, no, I'm just a tax expert. You don't want my opinion on that. Okay. 
Mr. Shire. I, I think one of the underlying assumptions is that, is that somehow all of these risks are out there in the economy and are known by some parties, and the only issue is just simply gathering them in a centralized source and then making decisions on that basis. The problem with that perspective is that the risks that hedge funds and their counterparties pose to their economy are A, very, very highly complex, and B, constantly changing. And in fact, in 2006, Federal Reserve uh, um, Chairman Ben Bernanke rejected a proposal to create a centralized database of hedge fund, hedge fund positions for a couple reasons, one of which being that type of information in order to be gathered would be required to be gathered from all financial participants in the economy, not just hedge funds, but also banks, their lenders, their counterparties, and even investors and creditors to some extent too. Second of all, when that type of information is created by regulators, it creates a false sense of security among market participants that these these risks are adequately being monitored and managed. And in fact, to a large extent, the reason the investment banks took on so much leverage and collapsed was because market participants were under the false assumption that the Securities and Exchange Commission, through their Consolidated Supervised Entities program, was monitoring the risks of investment banks to their investors into the economy, but it was not doing so. By contrast, hedge funds, it's widely known by market participants, are not being, uh, have no oversight by any central authority and, are, and rely upon the market discipline of their counterparties. And it's for that reason that losses from hedge funds typically do not spread to the entire economy. This idea of systemic risk is an idea, but it's really just a hypothetical. It has not come to fruition in practice. A much more instructive uh, example of, of large hedge funds collapsing is not long-term capital management in 1998, but actually Amaranth Advisors, which happened in 2006. That hedge fund was much larger by at least $2 billion than long-term capital management. It disappeared almost virtually overnight, or at least within one week, and the markets didn't even notice. Why? Because Amaranth and its counterparties were engaging in proper risk management. And it's true that investment banks are no longer there to provide capital to, to purchase failed hedge funds, but other hedge funds are there to purchase e each other's. And in fact, as we speak right now, new hedge funds are being launched, which really displays and reflects the vitality of that industry um, compared to, for example, the banking sector. And I haven't heard many banks being um, created in recent times. Thank you. Thanks. Let me continue. Uh, um, I think I – Mr. Shadow, it, you, your, the briefing memorandum that was produced by the majority uh, implies that hedge funds were major drivers of the subprime housing market through the large investments in collateralized uh, debt obligations backed by subprime mortgages. They cite figures from the OECD estimating that hedge funds purchased 46 percent of all CDOs and over 70 percent of the most risky portions of these investment vehicles. But in your testimony, you estimate that the hedge funds never had more than 29 percent of the CDO market and probably less. I guess my question isn't debating the, what the facts are, but were hedge funds significant contributors to the growth of the subprime mortgage market or weren't they? Um, no, they were not. And this, this is not just based upon the numbers. We take a step back and, and think, what is the purpose of a structured investment vehicle, a special purpose vehicle that's going to put together a collateralized debt obligation? The purpose of that vehicle is to provide higher, um, higher interest rates paid out by investment grade securities for institutional investors, such as pension funds and insurance companies, to be able to invest under a certain class of security that has a certain safety rating, but nonetheless gives them a higher grade. Hedge funds have no genuine interest in purchasing CDOs because the CDO is to some extent another private investment fund. If hedge funds want exposures to those types of risks, they can buy the underlying bonds or what have you. And in fact, the reason hedge funds concentrated their investments in the riskiest tranche was because that's, an, that's first of all, it's an equity tranche, which pays out a much higher interest rate because it is more risky. And it's important to know that those equity CDO tranches were five to less percent of a typical, ec um, a typical equity uh, CDO deal, which is primarily based upon, again, to get those investment grade ratings. Thank, thank you. Uh, the Chair recognizes uh, Congressman Cummings for five minutes. Thank you all for your uh, testimony. Let me make sure I, I got this right, Professor Bankman. I would like to ask you about your testimony that some hedge fund managers may currently pay taxes at a lower rate than Americans who make less money. If I understand your testimony correctly, the earnings of a hedge fund managers are called carried interest. Is that correct? That is right. And to the extent that these earnings can be tied to long-term gains, the tax rate is just 
15 percent. Is that right? That's right. I just want to make sure I got, I mean, because I, I thought I was hearing something different. And I want to compare that 15 percent tax rate to the tax rates of some other working Americans, very hardworking Americans. The Bureau of Labor Statistics has calculated the median earnings for various occupations in the American workforce. The median earnings for American school teachers were 43,000, Professor Backman, to 49,000 per year. What is the tax rate for a school teacher with that income? Well, if uh, it depends on their marital status, but if they're single, the 25 percent rate would start at about $32,000, I believe. So they would be paying tax at. Uh, 25 percent on that income, and there would be pay payroll tax they would be paying too. So it would be a 40 percent higher rate that is 25 uh, as compared to 15. Jesus Christ. The median earnings for a firefighter was 41,190. His or her tax rate would also, I think, be around that 25 percent right. range that you just talked about. Is that right? That's right. Now, the median hourly earnings for a plumber, I'm talking about plumbers here a lot lately, were $20.65 per hour, and that's about $41,000 per year. That's also taxed about at the 25 percent rate. Is that right? Uh, that would be right. Of, uh, of course, uh, there may be deductions from that, too. So we may be slightly overstating the rate on some of those cases. Well, let me get this. Let me ask you this way. So Joe the plumber is being taxed at a higher rate than Joe the investment banker. Is that right? Is that a fair uh, statement? Well, that would be true if it were Joe the fund manager. The no. investment bankers actually don't get that break. Okay. <laughs> so the fund manager. Yes. All right. Now, Professor Bankman, does this seem fair to you? No. On the average, the witnesses on the next panel made over $1 billion, $1 billion in 2007. Yet at least some portion of their earnings is being taxed at just a 15 percent rate. Is that fair? Uh, no, I don't believe that's uh, either fair or efficient. And why do you say that? Let's, let's concentrate on the word efficient. Why do you say it's not efficient? Well, a fundamental uh, goal of tax policy is to try to tax everything at the same rate. Otherwise, the tax system interferes with the flow of labor, the flow of resources. So it's inefficient to give a tax break to one occupation as opposed to, other, to another. We ought to start them off at the same rate. And we can all debate what that appropriate rate is. But nobody has ever offered a reason why this one slice of highly paid professionals should be taxed at a lower rate than other slices of either highly paid or uh, less highly paid professionals. Is there something that makes these guys so special that they get this 15 percent rate? I mean, because I'm sure people like Joe Plummer and others would like to try to get into that category. I mean, is there something special about these guys Well, the ladies? The, the rate has a, a, histor a long historical explanation to it, which uh, doesn't make hedge fund managers that benefit from the rate special, but does give a little bit of an explanation how we, to some extent, slipped into a situation where so many of our most highly paid members are getting preferential tax treatment. Well, let me just say this. This, this Congress, uh, the House twice voted to close this loophole, and it would have generated more than $30 billion in tax savings according to the Congressional Budget Office. Unfortunately, this provision has not been passed by the Senate, and it was opposed, opposed by the Bush administration. I hope we can correct this injustice once and for all next year. Would you agree? Yes. All right, I say my time is about up. I yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, welcome, all of you, to the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, it's very clear. It's very clear we've moved on to tax policy, and, and I'm actually glad we are, because I think it reveals uh, what we're in for in this Congress and the next Congress. Uh, I'm a member of Congress who, uh, who was, uh, got my capital gains treatment under the old tax law when I sold my business and came to Congress. So uh, I didn't get the 15 percent, and I did pay 10 percent or so to the state of California. Uh, in addition, but but let me just go through a couple of assumptions here since we're we're playing tax policy. Uh, Professor Bankman, uh, you lumped together 
the LBO firms, like the one that bought out my company, uh, and the, uh, the hedge funds. Now, isn't it true that a leveraged buyout firm, in fact, is a classic? I mean, these, these types of firms buy a company, they put skin in it, and over a long period of time, or sometimes short, they hope to, uh, to get a capital gains. Isn't, what, isn't capital gains over a hold of more than one year, by definition, yes or no, the existing tax law? Uh, yes. Okay. So we will just assume that you didn't really mean to say people who buy whole companies, uh, you know, should be somehow not entitled to this. That is not the loophole that I think Mr. Cummings was going to close. Let me go through another question. You talked about a banker. I am sorry, I apologize, a doctor. Isn't it true that if a doctor forms a medical practice and builds it up and then sells it, he gets capital gains treatment on that? That is yes right. No? Okay. So the doctor really does have the same opportunity. He just has to avail himself of it. If he works for a hospital and he doesn't own a piece of the clinic or hospital, then he doesn't avail himself. If he does invest in that in some sort of partnership, he, he gets that ability when it's sold. Isn't that true? That's right. But I think there's a distinction between the doctor's regular income, which is taxed at ordinary income rates, and the very occasional capital gain uh, he recognizes. I, and I appreciate uh, your feeling on that. And, and look, I'm one of those people that thinks we should look at hedge fund income, including profit sharing and ask whether or not that should be long term or short. I have no problem with looking at it. Um, but of course, I am not on the Ways and Means Committee normally, so I don't get that opportunity. Uh, Let us go through a couple of other things. And by the way, Professor Bankman, thank you for supporting the flat tax. Uh, I, I appreciate that all, we should all be taxed at the same rate and we shouldn't use tax policy to manipulate the economy. Unfortunately, the Congress historically has not agreed with that and they have micromanaged it in the other Ways and Means Committee. Uh, Professor Rutter, uh, Ruder, I guess, uh, you, you sort of alluded to uh, the problems of, of lack of regulation and the SEC not getting uh, uh, authority. I just have a, a, a brief question. Would you agree that a size for SEC filing and regulating of hedge funds so as to take the small firm, let's say, let's say you have two clients and no matter how much money, it's just two clients that you're you're uh, investing on behalf of. That those wouldn't be sensible for a hedge fund or any fund to have to report to the SEC. But if you had two thousand, you probably would fit. Uh, would you say that there are numbers, let's say uh, a dozen or more clients and more than a hundred million dollars under management, that would trigger? A SEC requirement. Uh, it is possible to, to ar arrange regulation in that way. The Investment Advisors Act today, the the uh, the, the legislation. Right, of I today believe it, it has 17. Well, it, I'm not talking about numbers of people, but there's an inspection uh, split between the states and the and the SEC at 25 million dollars. If there's if there's less than 25 million dollars under management, it's not. It's not regulated by the SEC, and I would support that kind of distinction. Uh, it's just a matter of deciding what the number is. Is it, is it 25 million? Is it 100 million? But one ha has to come to some conclusion about that. I appreciate that, and I think you're you're right that we we do have to if we regulate, we do have to recognize that we can't regulate every entity. Uh, Mr. Shutup, uh, I, I've got a couple of questions that you're probably very equipped to answer. Uh, first of all. Uh, <sighs> You know, this, this whole question of hedge funds, isn't it true that hedge funds normally hedge both, if you will, long and short? And as a result, when they unwind, they tend to unwind more neutral than other long only investments. That's fair to say that's correct. Okay. And uh, isn't it true that uh, some of the biggest investors in hedge funds are union pension plans and even state plans that they, uh, they will have a percentage, usually 5 percent or less, but a percentage they are putting in hedge funds? Increasingly so, yes. And isn't it true that the inefficiency in the market is partially because we built up a strategy of most mutual funds not being able to go to all cash, not being able to essentially leave a certain uh, paradigm that they are in, and to a great extent if you want to limit risk and you are you're in a fund that is 100 percent invested in small caps or whatever, that a hedge fund is often the way, if you are a big investor like a union pension plan, that you, you hedge against your other investments, which are 100 percent long. Correct. Hedge funds are more flexible. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Congressman Tierney. Thank you, Madam Chairman. 
Uh, I want to thank the witnesses here today. But Professor Lowe, I want to ask you something about what you said in your testimony. You talked about the fact that we have not yet seen the full impact of the unraveling and the deleveraging of the hedge fund industry. And I think you predicted that we uh, could see thousands more of additional uh, entities go under. Uh, so I guess about 9,000 uh, different hedge funds out there, estimates, and you are talking about a good, healthy percentage of them going under. What would be the potential impacts of the collapse of that many hedge funds? Well, it is hard to say because, uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, we don't have a lot of information about their holdings, their leverage, the counterparties, or other aspects of their exposures. Uh, I suspect that a large number of them will be taken over by larger financial institutions, so the impact for those may be relatively minimal. But there may be a small number of very large hedge funds that have a variety of different counterparty relationships that could cause some market dislocation. And that is really the purpose of transparency, is to be able to tell whether or not we are looking at a significant event or not. I think the general perception of the public with respect to these hedge funds is that if they go under, so what? Uh, they are super rich people uh, who understand the risk, they are somewhat sophisticated, and what do we care? Uh, but I have heard, you know, discussed here in some of your testimony, that increasingly state and local and private pension funds are invested in them. So we really have a, a concern here about ordinary people involved in this, whether they know it or not, um, retirees, students, it could be millions of other citizens that are getting uh, affected by that. So tell me what the impact is if they go under. How does it affect Main Street? Well, clearly there's going to be losses faced by uh, uh, individual investors uh, uh, because one of the largest uh, uh, amount of assets that have come into the hedge fund industry over the last five years is from pension funds. Uh, so there will be an impact there. The question, though, is really whether or not that impact is anticipated or not. Uh, if I mentioned earlier that uh, dislocation happens not when losses occur, but when losses by individuals that are not prepared for those losses occur. The hedge funds that invest in the worst uh, uh, risk uh, uh, tranches, uh, they are prepared for losses. But when money market funds, uh, pension funds, mutual funds invest in AAA securities that then uh, lose substantial value, that is really the cause for dislocation. And that is where the transparency, transparency aspect comes in, I suspect. That, but the transparency you are talking about is disclosure to the SEC in a sort of a, a confidential way. That is right. What transparency is there to investors uh, from these hedge funds? My understanding is that you could invest in this hedge fund and have no particular rights to be able to get information as to just what the investments are, what the circumstances are. Is that correct? That, that is right. Let the buyer or let the investor beware. So here you have a, hedge, a pension fund investing in a hedge fund. Not only is whoever is managing the, hedge, the pension fund unaware, but certainly the investors, the pensioners or whatever, are totally unaware. Do you think that that continues to hold as a good uh, policy, or do you think that there ought to be more transparency to the investors uh, from the managers of these hedge funds? Well, for the most part, uh, investors would probably not be able to make use of the kind of transparency that I'm proposing to the regulators. Um, most investors delegate their decisions, particularly involving sophisticated and highly risky investments like hedge funds, to professional managers. So uh, the managers and the ultimate institutional investors, I think, would have the responsibility to monitor those kinds of risks. And of course, the regulators would be focused on a different uh, issue, which is the risk to the entire financial system. Is it too late for transparency to even uh, help uh, individuals who belong to a retirement fund that is invested in hedge funds that may go under at this stage? I don't think it's ever too late. I think that uh, additional transparency even now will provide some sense of what we're likely to expect to see over the next year or two, and that could help investors uh, with their own planning for financial market dislocations yet to come. Does anybody on the panel recommend any stronger intervention on behalf of these pensioners or the state, local, or private pension funds that are uh, being invested in hedge funds and that may stand the prospect of losing significant amounts of money if as large a proportion of the hedge funds go under as some have predicted? I would just like to say that it's it's very atypical, in fact, unheard of for hedge funds not to make substantial disclosures to their investors, especially when they are institutions like pension funds. 
hedge fund uh, investors typically demand quite a bit amount of information from the fund, and funds, in order to compete for investor wealth, will make substantial disclosures, and in fact, more disclosures, and in fact, higher quality and more easily understandable disclosures than mutual funds make to their investors. It's actually much easier to be able to contact and have a discussion with a hedge fund manager about your investments in the hedge fund as opposed to a mutual fund manager. Yeah, that's interesting, Mr. Shev, because you know some of the information we looked at in the second panel on their funds disclosed very little information, uh, very little. In Professor Lowe, would you agree with that? I mean, it's it's not like they give out very specific, detailed information to their investors. Well, that's right. I think it depends on the hedge fund, but by and large, hedge funds are not obligated to provide transparency to investors, and in many cases, that's one of the reasons managers decide to launch hedge funds as opposed to mutual funds. It's to protect their proprietary information uh, that they uh, uh, are using to uh, make money for their investors. The uh, time is I'm, I'm sorry. Statement just, and then your time I wanted to expired. add one more comment to uh, Congressman Tierney's uh, question about pension funds, which is that w one issue that uh, we haven't talked about today is the impact uh, of potential hedge fund failures uh, on the PBGC's ability to make good on uh, pension fund claims. Uh, the PBGC recently has faced significant losses because of their internal investment policies. That might actually hamper their abilities to make good on these guarantees, and that's an issue that I think we need to consider. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Congressman Souter. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I, I would like to continue to follow up a little bit with Professor uh, Loke, as you have in your written statement an extended discussion on risk. And uh, it seems to me that that is one of the fundamental questions here. Do, in, in a general way, other than uh, temporary aberrations, do you know of any, uh, what, where the yield was disconnected from the risk? In other words, isn't it? A, isn't, hasn't, hasn't the markets accurately reflected that whenever you got a higher yield, you took more risk? That's typically been the case, yes. And uh, wouldn't it also be true that the more you invested in economies uh, that were uh, kind of away from established economies, you would assume there would be higher risk? That's right. And wouldn't you assume that the less transparency there was, there would be higher risk? That's right. In other words, if, if you are a, a, a doctor or a lawyer and you are investing in a fund that isn't very transparent, I would think that you would assume in any logical way that you were taking more risk. You should. That is correct. And now what becomes fundamental here and what a lot of people, and, and understand I voted for both versions of the rescue package, but there is a lot of bitterness in my district in Indiana, which is relatively conservative, and as we see other parts of the country uh, struggling where they got great rewards and now are getting uh, uh, penalized and expect the rest of us to pick up some of their risk because they don't want to assume that the risk. Now, in your, your written comments, you more or less compare that you say uh, people have a, a propensity to, to irresponsible behavior, more or less comparing uh, uh, drunks, people who drink too much and go out and drive, uh, to some of the people here who weren't paying attention to the risk part. But then those of us who don't get drunk and go out and drive are now expected to bail them out. Um, that, uh, and this is why there is so much anger at the grassroots level, because there seems to be a disconnection from reward and risk, because in fact not everybody took those kind of risks. Not everybody invests in the higher risk uh, parts. In, the, in this risk, uh, uh, as we look at the debate over hedge funds and other things, how much do you believe this risk was a question of the mortgage, the, the mortgage market than being the core of all the other questions? Well, I think that certainly uh, the, the mortgage market was the epicenter for this, uh, uh, this series of losses. Uh, and there is a fundamental uh, issue about how those markets grew so quickly over time without the proper uh, infrastructure to be able to support that. Um, and uh, the idea behind regulation is to try to correct those kinds of market failures. Do you believe that the securitization of the credit card market is starting to look like what happened in the mortgage market? It, it does have the same elements, yes. And part of the question here is, is because in, in your discussion of risk and what you just said in response to Mr. Tierney was is that uh, part of the problem here is people who who really weren't thinking they were getting risk and their ability to absorb risk suddenly found risk. The question there is, is where were the pension managers? In other words, uh, part of the debate here is how much does government provide the regulation and 
I mean, I, I have a business degree and a management degree, and the more we have these hearings, the more I'm thinking is, did people pay any attention in class? Did any of them really know what being a manager means? That, they, that maybe an individual goes out and gets drunk and, and drives. Maybe somebody does irresponsible behavior, but that's why you hire pension managers. Where were they? Well, part of the problem uh, that I mentioned in my written testimony is that we didn't have enough expertise in financial markets to properly assess these then, risks. Let me interrupt a minute. You said, this is basic stuff, that risk was correlated with return, that where you put your money was related, that the housing market, anybody could see it was going bananas out of, out of doubling in growth. Uh, that any, anybody in elementary could see that as you extended to six packs in different tranches, you were getting farther and farther out, which normal basic management would say, go check your base. The farther out you go, go check your base. Normal management would say that, uh, that, that as you're doing more overseas risky investment, you should do that. The pension fund managers, while I understand that it wasn't perfect information, that in sense was a warning too, mm -hmm. the less information you have. I'm trying to come back here. Some of this has to be blamed on incompetence of management, and yet nobody will take blame. Mm -hmm. No individual managers will take blame. No government agency will take blame. And I would argue that, that in fact, many people got out of these markets. Some funds didn't get into these markets because, in fact, they saw it. Mm -hmm. Well, as, as Warren Buffett said, a rising tide lifts all boats, and during periods of great prosperity, there is a complacency that's induced by this kind of success that blinds people to risks, and that's one of the purposes for better transparency and, frankly, for regulation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Congressman Lynch. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for holding this hearing, and I want to thank the panelists as well for their thoughtful uh, advice for the committee. Uh, just, a, just a quick uh, uh, comment. I know we're trying to make comparisons uh, uh, to the Amaranth uh, uh, situation, the Amaranth collapse, as well as long-term capital management. And it's difficult to make a broad projection from just a couple of examples. But I do want to note that uh, the Amaranth collapse was simplified in, in some degree by the fact that it was largely an effort to, to <coughs> corner the market on one commodity, uh, natural gas. Whereas, and, and, and fortunately, it, it was a good time in the market, and, and, and you're right, uh, uh, Mr. Shadab, that uh, they were able to, to dump other uh, higher quality corporate equities into the market, and, and it was a good time to sell, so they were able to cushion some of their, their, their losses. Uh, however, if you look at the long-term capital management example, uh, there was less than $3 billion in the fund, but they had, by leverage, uh, uh, you know, built that up to about $100 billion, and actually, by the use of complex derivatives, had a notional value of over a trillion dollars. A trillion dollars notional value, they had $3 billion in the fund. It, you know, and so that, that really, you know, spells the, the possibility for systemic risk, uh, at least to me. L let me. Let me just go back. You all have said, to some degree, uh, with the express, the ex exception of Mr. Bankman, I think, that uh, hedge funds didn't cause this collapse. They didn't cause it. And I agree with that, that, that statement. However, I want to ask you, do you think that the structure and the opacity and the, and let's remember now, hedge funds have purchased the, the vast majority of these complex derivatives and CDOs. They are the major purchases here. Have they amplified the negative impact of, of this economic downturn. If they have not caused it, has their structure and the, the, uh, the lack of transparency and the concentration in, in those complex derivatives and CDOs, has that amplified the impact of the crisis? I would like you all to comment. Uh, I will take the first crack at that, if you don't mind. I, I think that is the case. I think that the participation in the complex derivative markets by hedge funds in large quantities have, uh, have, have contributed to the uh, complexity of the market and to the risks that are, there are in the markets. And that is why I think we should have some system for having the hedge fund positions be known mm 
to a central regulator so that regulator could, could look at all, at all risk positions across the markets and see where the systemic risk problems are. It might also be able to identify the long-term capital management twin in, w in which there is a single hedge fund participant who may itself bring down the market. Well, well, the short, short answer to Congressman Lynch's question is uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't think anybody knows because we don't have that kind of transparency to be able to say for sure whether hedge funds have exacerbated or possibly ameliorated the kind of, uh, of market uh, gyrations that have gone on in this particular area. Uh, that is one of the reasons we need transparency. Uh, however, it is the case that hedge funds, because they take on these e extraordinary risks, provide a valuable service, but when those risks end up causing great losses, they could also, on um, the, the opposite side of that same coin, is <coughs> they could provide great dislocation. Okay. Mr. Shadab? Well, um, a couple things. One part, the real core of this crisis is that banking institutions, commercial banks and investment banks had these CDOs and other mortgage related securities on their assets. So to, that, to the extent that hedge funds had purchased them from the banking institutions and other investors that purchased them and taken them away from banks, they have um, ameliorated the crisis to that extent. I mean, if, if these banks had gotten all the bad assets off of their books, we wouldn't have that core epicenter of a crisis happening f from the banking sector, which is so important for the entire economy um, happening in the way we did uh, right now. And in addition, it's important to distinguish between credit default swaps, which are derivatives, and collateralized debt obligations, which are actually securities. Now, hedge funds trade were very large traders, but not the largest. It was banks. Uh, of CDS's um, credit default swaps. And their trading of those instruments, along with bank trades of those instruments, have really brought um, liquidity and some price discovery and transparency to the risks that are associated with their underlying credit obligations. And in fact, the, 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 um, the fall of any institution in relation to I'm their. Sorry, Mr. Shadab, you're burning my time. Um, yeah. Do you think it's amplified the, the impact or no? And, and I appreciate it. I don't mean to cut you short. It's just that no under this structure, we, we have very little opportunity. It's, it's hard to be sure. I don't think so, though. Okay. Well, that's, that's fair enough. Uh, Professor Lowe, just with the last few seconds I have, you did mention the idea about this NTSB type organization to be able to come in. The only problem I have with that is that the NTSB usually comes and does accident reconstruction, and they're, ne they're not uh, very good proactively, but they're excellent in, in forensically uh, telling us what, what actually happened. But uh, I'm out of time, but it, at some point I would like to hear your thoughts on how that would, would actually operate, because I think it's exactly what we need. And I, and I, I thank all of the witnesses for your testimony today. Thank that, you, thank you uh, Mr. Uh, Congressman Lynch. And, and if, if Professor Lowe would like to respond to your question. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, uh, thank you, Congressman Lynch. I, I um, believe that the National Transportation Safety Board uh, is an incredibly valuable tool for developing deeper understanding uh, into uh, a variety of different uh, uh, of failures and blowups. And um, while you are right that the NTSB uh, does not have any oversight responsibilities, the FAA obviously controls issues regarding airline safety, mm -hmm. the fact is that by publishing a publicly available report that describes the details of various accidents, the public learns an enormous amount of what happened and how to prevent it from happening in the future. And I think that this is uh, the, the, the most sensible starting point uh, for thinking about uh, new regulations uh, in this industry. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Yarmouth. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Shadow, I want to start with you. The we're going to have on the next panel several uh, people who are very wealthy and who have been involved in these types of activities. Is there any, from a practical perspective, is there any difference between what any one of these, uh, our next panel witnesses, could do and what a hedge fund could do? They could do as individuals what a hedge fund can do. Do you mean the distinction between that, their own personal? Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, you got you got George Soros with, uh, you know, with the net worth of billions of dollars. You have a Warren Buffett, not on the panel, but you have a Warren Buffett with billions of dollars. You have a Michael Bloomberg with billions of dollars. Is there anything that prevents them from doing what a hedge fund does? With their own personal wealth, I don't think there's anything that prevents them doing the same things. Right. So, in your testimony, when you say that there's a danger in in regulating hedge funds because they would lose their unique benefits. Uh, why is a hedge fund 
why does it present a unique benefit when any individual with a lot of money could do the same thing? Oh, because it, it allows the investment manager not to use their own personal wealth, but to pool it from others. Sure, there are exceptions when you have um, hedge fund managers who over time have accumulated their own large personal wealth and can basically ha run their own hedge funds without having to go in to investors. But typically, a hedge fund manager, in order to implement their trading, will need wealth from other investors. So the hedge fund manager who's putting these deals together, uh, when you mentioned the societal benefits of hedge fund managers, that's really not what the hedge fund manager is interested in. He's not interested in, or she is not interested in necessarily highlighting the deficient management style of a corporation. They don't, they don't need to be to create those benefits. All right, but that, that's not their motivation. I would say um, unlikely that that's the case, correct? Right. So if, if we're worried about the impact, whether or not, as, as um, Professor Reuter described, we can definitively describe what the systemic risk is, we similarly cannot describe the systemic benefit of hedge funds, it seems to me, either, can we, Professor Reuter? Not we, we could, uh, uh, by aggregating information, uh, know, know where the hedge funds are, as a group are headed and, and be able to find out uh, where they are hedging and what they are doing. I don't think that would be the purpose uh, of, of the aggregation of risk, risk information, but uh, a, a, a regulator gathering information from all sources would be able to reach some conclusions uh, and to take, uh, take some action and may also even be able to issue some public statements uh, which would help the public to know what is going on. I, mean, I, I have a little hard time grasping this philosophically because, again, if we are all we are talking about is a group of individuals, let's say the, the members of our next panel all got together and they say we are just going to do our own hedge fund, uh, we are going to sit together in a living room and we are going to embark upon these strategies, there would clearly be no governmental interest that I could just uh, define except maybe some kind of a conspiracy to disrupt the market. Uh, so uh, is that really what we are talking about? Is this a, a distinction without a difference? Or? Oh, I think you are talking about the aggregation of assets uh, by the hedge funds in ways that uh, will far surpass the billions of dollars that these individual investors have, and, and that is the reason that we are concerned about it. Right. So this is a question of size. This is the whole argument about being too big to fail that we dealt with with AIG and, and some of the other entities that we are talking about. Well, I am not talking about uh, too big to fail in the sense that when we find a hedge fund uh, that is going to fail, that we, that we run, run into bail it out, I think we need to know what the effects of that failure will be on our system and, if necessary, take some preventative steps. Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to agree with you. That is why I am trying to ask this series of questions, because when, it, when I read that in some cases that all the trades on the New York Stock Exchange, 5 percent of all the trades were controlled by one trader in a, in a particular session, that is very disturbing, because that is an unbelievable amount of market power. Uh, I want to ask one question of, of Professor Bankman also. I have a friend who is a person I call upon to discuss these things. He's a master of the universe. He will remain nameless. And when I talked about carried interest with him some months ago, he said the problem with doing anything with carried interest is that all the hedge funds will do is restructure their, their uh, organizations so that they will convert everything into pure capital gains. They will take equity interest in the entity and then take capital gains, in which case the revenue to the Federal Government will actually be delayed, it will not increase and it will be delayed because they will just hold the, hold the investments longer. Do you have a response to that argument? Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. It's whenever you pass uh, a tax measure, it's always imperfect, and there's always ways to get around it. And so you're always trying to come up with a compromise that's going to get revenue and hopefully not make the law too complicated and improve efficiency and equity. And there'll always be ways around it. I've read the uh, the arguments that the industry is going to reorganize, and you know the the two and twenty and present form of industry organization have been around a long time. Even when, by the way, capital gain was not a factor, as it is not with us, respect to certain hedge funds. And I think experience shows that uh, uh, reorganizing industries and changing the way people do business uh, uh, is very costly and it doesn't happen very easily. So, so while I think that's something to watch, I, uh, I'm not convinced that that's the uh, concern that some people think. Thank you very much. Uh, Chairwoman Norton. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, <laughs> I'm interested in uh, a subject that's raised time and time again during this crisis, 
um, and that's the notion of regulation. It, it, it appears that we may have moved out of uh, uh, the mode we've been in a kind of to be or not to be, uh, to, a, uh, to regulate or not to regulate, that is, uh, to uh, something we don't hear a lot of discussion about. If you're going to regulate, how are you going to do it, who's going to do it, uh, not a lot of meat on those bones. Um, indeed, there may be a contest among various agencies. So I looked at your testimony. Let's start with you, Professor Liu. Uh, you raised the idea, and it's interesting you say, that one would have to expand the scope, of course one would, one doesn't think of the Federal Reserve as, as such a regulatory agency, but you raise the notion of the Federal Reserve uh, as the direct uh, oversight uh, agency for at least the largest of these funds. Um, why do you think the Federal Reserve uh, is the uh, best of, of the agencies to do such regulation? Well, primarily because uh, the main issue regarding hedge funds and systemic risk is their impact on the liquidity of markets. And as we know, the Federal Reserve is the lender of last resort. They are the, uh, the manager of uh, market liquidity. So if it's a liquidity issue that threatens the global financial system through the hedge fund industry, the Federal Reserve will be the natural uh, regulatory agency to focus on that. Uh, Chairman, Arona, you, um, in your testimony, uh, suggest, of course, your um, the agency you chaired, the SEC, uh, to um, essentially um, uh, register, have have hedge funds register uh, with the SEC. How do you think a rules register with the SEC would? Uh, improve its uh, ability to monitor and think this crisis now um, uh, would um, uh, help uh, to reduce the systemic risks we have seen? Well, first of all, I think that the registration provisions ought to extend uh, to, to hedge funds uh, as they do not under the current law. Uh, secondly, the registration would allow the uh, SEC to engage in inspection activities, uh, but currently they do not have the power, even in the inspection of investment advisors, uh, to seek uh, uh, risk management information. And I would expand uh, that inspection power so that they would be able to go into a hedge fund advisor and find out what are the risk management systems that are being used? Uh, what, are the, what are the nature and extents of the risks? And who are the counterparties? And that would help the SEC, uh, first of all, to make some judgments about whether the risk management systems are, are good, and secondly, to pass information on to a central regulator, such as the Federal Reserve Board, uh, to, uh, to aggregate that information and come to some decisions about how to manage the liquidity risk in the economy. I, I wish you'd tell me the difference between what you are proposing now and and the rule uh, apparently in 2004 that the SEC actually passed um, uh, the hedge fund uh, sector, however, heavily lobbied against the rule. Uh, and it was ultimately overturned by the courts. Uh, Chairman Cox and the SEC did not seek uh, to appeal it and um, did not come to Congress uh, for new authority. So the SEC, I take it, has no authority now, not even the authority under that rule. And what's the difference between that rule uh, and the rule, if any, that uh, you have in mind? Well, the, the, the Goldstein case uh, uh, overruled the uh, SEC's attempt to, uh, to have inspection rights over hedge funds, hedge fund advisors. And the Commission did not appeal that rule, that ruling, but it did. Did you support that rule? Yeah, I, I, yes, I support the fact that they should have inspection right over all hedge fund advisors. And as I said, I, I think that's going to take congressional action. And I think that the, the inspection power ought to be increased so that they are able to get the kind of risk management information uh, that's needed to protect the society. Well, uh, Professor Lowe, do, do you see this kind of marriage between the SEC and, and the Federal Reserve that could come out of, of listening to both of you, that the, the um, information would be passed on to the Federal Reserve and then you'd have a, uh, 
a regulatory um, uh, a regulatory setup that we could have confidence in? Well, n no, I don't, uh, Congressman Norton. I I feel that uh, there it, there's a different there's a different purpose for registration under the 40 Act, uh, which is investor protection. Investor protection is a separate issue from systemic risk. And I believe that even now, if you uh, ask all hedge funds to register under the 40 Act uh, or the, under the Inves Investment Advisors Act, uh, they will not provide the kind of information that we need in order to get transparency. So transparency is risk. not enough. You need somebody to, to be a regulator, and you think that should be the Federal Reserve? That's right. Uh, can, can I just? Comment. Uh, what I'm saying is, you need to have an expansion of the inspection power. The Federal Reserve already can receive information from the banking sector, uh, and uh, the the Federal Reserve's administration of the uh, of the banking sector has has different objectives uh, than the SEC's rec regulation of the security sector. The banking system is is in, is banking regulators are concerned about safety and soundness of banks. Uh, the SEC is concerned uh, about the the capital markets uh, and uh, and the matter of of, of risk-based activities. And I think we need two regulators sharing information rather than a single regulator. Uh, Professor Lowe, would you would you like to respond to that? Well, so I, I, it's always dangerous to disagree with a former chairman of the SEC. Um, but let me uh, say that I think the information regarding systemic risk is different from the information under the Investment Advisors Act. Uh, and with regard to garnering information about uh, systemic risk, it's possible to obtain that, not necessarily directly from hedge funds, but from the prime brokers that have all of the positions, all the leverage, and all the counterparties among the hedge funds. So it is now possible to obtain that information very efficiently from a very small number of prime brokers. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Cooper is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Investors need to know how to swim, but we have also got to keep the sharks out of the pool. When you have large pension funds investing in hedge funds, shouldn't there be truth in advertising so that they know whether it is a true hedge fund or whether it is not hedging at all, but in fact speculating heavily? And shouldn't perhaps these speculative funds be called speculative funds? But the current situation with trade secrets and a black box surrounding the true investment strategy, pension managers don't really know whether they're getting hedging or speculation. Professor Lowe? Oh, what I would argue that it's always a good idea to have truth in advertising, uh, and certainly that applies to the hedge fund industry as well as any other. Uh, another example of truth in advertising is money market funds uh, that uh, have the uh, one dollar uh, NAV, but in fact uh, don't have that kind of guarantee for that one dollar, and they break the buck. That's another example of uh, uh, less than truth in advertising. What about volatility only strategies? You know the roller coasters we've seen in the market, 500 point swings in a day. That's neither long nor short. Is that uh, productive? behavior, when Joseph Schumpeter said capitalism is the process of creative destruction, he really didn't endorse the roller coaster at the same time, did he? Well, in a way, I think uh, Schumpeter did, because his argument is that free-flowing capitalism uh, is going to require occasional blow-ups just like what we're going through now. And uh, out of the ashes, a much stronger capitalistic system should arise. But why not 1,000-point swings in a day or 2,000-point swings? Wouldn't that be even more? Productive? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, it depends upon whether the underlying economics justifies it. But as I said, if you have the proper disclosure for investors, if they are prepared for those kinds of swings, uh, then uh, that would be fine. If can be the longest word in the English language. What about wannabe hedge fund managers? Not just rogue traders, but folks inside perhaps large commercial banks who get enough leeway to pretend they are hedge fund managers. How significant a sector would this be, and how dangerous are they? Well, clearly th that uh, does pose a danger, uh, but hopefully over time those managers ultimately get weeded out. And the process of hedge funds uh, closing uh, and new hedge funds rising, uh, I think, really uh, underscores that uh, kind of uh, birth and death process. Well, these wouldn't necessarily be uh, authorized. You know, this, the push for yield is so great. 
sometimes you can look the other way. And these operations are so vast, you don't necessarily know mm -hmm. what, in fact, is being done. I, I agree. Is there a way to measure the size or significance? Uh, currently, no. Hitchcock? Currently, no, there is no way because we don't have that level of transparency. That is one of the reasons that I think all of us are calling for that. Mm -hmm. I think the key area is going to be the interaction between hedge funds and derivatives. As I understand derivatives, it is possible to buy derivative products with embedded leverage. So when you and your excellent testimony cited relatively low leverage ratios, especially recently, you have to really look at a combined measure of leverage, don't you? And That's right. We're still, the committee is without information on that, the, the true leverage that's, in fact, involved. That's right. That's another area where I think greater transparency is necessary. Leverage by itself is not necessarily a bad thing, but undisclosed, it, it can be. Should there be capital requirements for derivatives? I agree with uh, uh, Mr. Reuter that uh, we need to have organized exchanges, standardized contracts, and a clearing corporation for certain OTC derivatives like credit default swaps. How are these hedge funds going to operate without investment banks now that all the major investment banks have converted into bank holding companies? And I guess the real question is, how are they going to operate without the deep capital markets that they were accustomed to? Well, hedge funds are nothing if not adaptive, and my sense is that they will certainly adapt to this new economic reality very quickly. In fact, uh, I believe that they already have, and uh, new hedge funds are being started to take advantage of the kind of opportunities that are presented by current market conditions. Um, I see that my time is expiring. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Mr. Sarbanes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you all for your testimony. Um, I wanted to get to this concept of the sophisticated investor a little bit more because that's sort of the underpinning of the the original exemptions from these statutes that are quite old now and must have been based on premises and a rationale that is uh, obsolete in many ways. And you know, as I listen to this discussion. The exemptions are designed for people who are sophisticated, for institutional investors and so forth. But uh, it seems like the standard for exemption oughtn't to be so much the sophistication, although I'd like you to tell me if you think, Professor Bankman, for example, whether anyone can be sophisticated enough these days to warrant an exemption. Uh, but the standard maybe ought to be not how sophisticated you are, in quotes, but you know how much, uh, what kind of, what kind of, of, of uh, investments you're holding. Um, you know who's who's giving you their money to invest, and how much damage can you do with it. So speak to that because I think that is going to reassessing this concept of the sophisticated investor. May may be the foundation for the overall uh, redesign of the regulatory framework in this particular arena. So maybe you could talk to that. I think you probably want the you probably don't want the tax guy on the panel. So uh, so I think I should uh, throw that to my colleagues here. Okay. Probably. Well, the Securities and Exchange Commission has recognized. Uh, the need for higher dollar limits to create a, a threshold for uh, accredited investors. And it, it has a proposal that is, uh, it has made but not, has not adopted, saying that you have to have $5 million in investable assets in order to become a sophisticated investor and be able to in invest in uh, pooled vehicles. Uh, that is a very good step in the right direction. Uh, the, the problem is, as we begin to say, who's sophisticated and who's not sophisticated, uh, it's not always that dollar levels are going to be the determining amount. Uh, we, we have already uh, been wondering how the, some of the pension funds got involved in the, in, the, in the hedge fund area. And there all I can say is that we have to draw a line someplace and say we're going to put the responsibilities on the stewards of other people's money to make proper investigations. We, we can't proceed by bright line dollar numbers in every case to, to, to make distinctions uh, because at some point by uh, putting 
bright dollar limo levels at the high, high levels, we are going, uh, going to prevent the kind of investment we have had. So I think the Commission is on the right track going towards a $5 million uh, 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 assets under investment as a, as a bright line. Professor Lowe, do you want to talk about this sophistication concept? Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, in financial markets, there is a common risk of confusing your W-2 with your IQ. Uh, just because uh, you are uh, wealthy does not necessarily make you sophisticated. So I have always thought that the sophisticated investor threshold was really more about the ability to withstand losses. Uh, but I think when it comes to institutional investors where there is a fiduciary responsibility, for example, pension plan sponsors, it may make sense to actually impose some kind of an educational minimum so that uh, we can be assured that a pension plan sponsor that has fiduciary responsibilities to pension plan participants uh, would be investing wisely. Yeah, I guess what I'm, I'm struggling with is you're, you're looking at this in terms of uh, uh, what the burden is on the investor to demonstrate their sophistication. And I'm thinking about it in terms of the arena into which that investor goes and whether that arena um, is regulated. The concept seems to be that once a bunch of, once a, once a group of people are determined to be sophisticated, then you're going to let them into a ring that is completely unregulated because they're sophisticated. But you may be letting them into a ring uh, where they can do a lot of damage, where they can run over a lot of innocent bystanders and so forth. So that, ought to, that standard ought to be operating more than it has in terms of deciding whether to regulate that area. Well, I, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, but I would also add that in defense of pension plan sponsors that have put money in hedge funds, First of all, by and large, their amounts of investments that they have put in to hedge funds is fairly low, probably less than 5 percent uh, of pension assets uh, in the aggregate. Second, if you look at the performance of hedge funds as a category, as a broad group, uh, for 2008, hedge funds are probably down on average 10 percent to 15 percent for the year, whereas the S&P is down about 30 to 35 percent for the year. And so uh, the idea behind hedge funds being able to take short positions and benefit from down markets, that is something that pension plans uh, have benefited from. Uh, however, there are blow-ups that occur, and th that is one of the reasons I have argued that we need to examine those blow-ups to make sure that other investors, including pension plan sponsors, are fully aware and fully prepared for those eventualities. Well, and of course, as we discussed with, with, um, with Chairman Greenspan, when, when blow-ups occur, the people that get hurt are not just the the ones that are, are driving the train or driving the car or whatever. It's, it's this group of bystanders that uh, gets pulled in as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Van Hollen. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank all of you gentlemen for your uh, testimony, uh, Professor Ruder and Professor Lowe. I had some questions uh, related to your uh, proposal to require greater transparency. I think we have talked a little bit about the history of efforts to provide greater uh, transparency in reporting requirements, for example, uh, putting hedge funds under some of the reporting requirements and jurisdiction of the SEC, uh, both to protect investors, including, as we have heard, lots of pension funds, uh, as well as to address the potential for systemic risk and have an early warning system to detect that. Uh, let me just take that one step further. Uh, assuming you, we, we change the law and provide for greater transparency and allow the SEC to uh, get this information, I understand you are suggesting on a confidential basis. Uh, wh what powers would you suggest the SEC have when it looks at that information and says that either the investors are at risk or you face a systemic risk? Would you be proposing the SEC uh, also have additional powers, for example, uh, changing leverage requirements with respect to a particular uh, hedge fund if, the, based on the information they collect, they say, hey, we got a real, real problem here. What additional powers would you give to the SEC if, if they reveal, through their investigation, a serious threat either to the investors or a systemic risk? No, I, I am not uh, suggesting that the SEC be given that kind of power. I think the SEC should uh, learn what the management systems are. Uh, inspect those management systems, ma risk management systems, and criticize the way they are operating. Uh, with regard to the broad information about leverage, about 
risk positions. Uh, I think that should go to a, uh, uh, to a regulator such as the Federal Reserve Board, which would then be able to aggregate that, that information and, and make some, uh, make, take some steps regarding the entire economy. I, I think it would be wrong for the result of this uh, regulatory reform that we are going through to, to have some government agency try to tell uh, investors what their leverage uh, should be. Uh, that, the exception of that, of course, is in the banking area where the, where the banking prudential regulators do impose leverage requirements. But I think for the high risk individuals, the, 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 uh, cl including the hedge funds, uh, we should not be doing that. Okay. Well, at this point, I think it would be premature to, for me to propose any kind of additional powers to be granted to the SEC or any agency since we, we, there is so little that we know about this sector. Uh, but I, as a hypothetical, if the kind of information that Professor Ruder and I have proposed to be disclosed uh, shows a very large uh, and isolated risk for one or two, uh, two big to fail organizations, at that point, it may be the case that the Federal Reserve would uh, be called in to impose either capital adequacy requirements or maximum leverage uh, constraints on that too big to fail institution. But that is still very much a hypothetical. Right. Let, well, let me just follow up a little bit uh, on that point. I mean, does the Federal Reserve or today would have the power to go and do that now? Or would you have to? So, so let me make sure I understand both your testimony. You would, you, Professor Reuter, wouldn't give that to the SEC, and I understand, Professor Lowe, you would say that if the SEC found something that might be, you know, a, a big problem to the economy, they would then go to the, the Federal Reserve. But would that require? Let me just make sure I understand. Would that require that Congress provide the Federal Reserve with additional authorities with respect to hedge funds in this area to take action? I believe so. I believe so too. You, you, you. It, it, it probably should be the Federal Reserve, but uh, you, you have a. Uh, the, tre tre the Treasury blueprint uh, uh, talking about a market stability regulator, uh, somebody that might play that function. I happen to think the Federal Reserve is the right, uh, is the right agency to do that. Okay. If I could just uh, ask you a quick question on the uh, short uh, positions. There is a lot of discussion about uh, the role of head funds in uh, naked short selling. Of course, the SEC took action. Uh, do you think that uh, hedge funds should be required to disclose their short positions on an ongoing basis? Uh, well, I, I believe that um, under certain conditions it may be uh, advisable for hedge funds to disclose, but not necessarily publicly. Uh, hedge funds spend a lot of time and effort uh, uh, developing models and information about uh, overvalued companies. That information uh, is extraordinarily important to get into the capital markets. If we eliminate the incentives for them to do so, we will hurt the informational efficiency of markets. But there are certain situations that may call for a kind of a 13F filing for short positions, but not necessarily to be made public, but to be given to regulators. Mm -hmm. But let me just ask you, would you, on a confidential basis to the regulator, would you have that on an ongoing basis, <laughs> the short selling? Yes. Disclosed? Yes. Thank you. For Professor Reuter? Uh, I, I agree with that. Uh, he, he refers to 13F. That, that's a kind of filing that's required uh, when, the, uh, when the numbers get fairly high so that uh, we wouldn't be just asking for all, sheets, all short sale positions to be revealed, but only the very large ones. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Van Hollen. Mr. Chase. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me ask you uh, this basic question. What is the greatest value? I realize you can't repeal the law of gravity, so I'm not looking to get rid of hedge funds, but tell me the greatest advantage or value to society of hedge funds and the greatest disadvantage of hedge funds. I'd like to go down the line. Well, the, uh, the, the hedge funds provide uh, uh, liquidity to the system because they, uh, because they invest uh, and they sell short. Uh, they, they provide uh, price discovery by, uh, um, by choosing the way they invest. Uh, they, they provide uh, the, the additional benefits of being a large, part, large participants in the system. Well, let me just go. Is, would anyone add any additional advantage to a hedge fund? 
Yes, sir. Well, one additional um, social benefit that hedge funds have created is disciplining corporate managers with whom they invest. Not a large percentage of hedge funds are devoted to being corporate activists, but the ones that are corporate activists actually are, are do very well at disciplining management. For example, a recent study has shown that if a hedge fund takes a, a corporate activist position in a company, CEO compensation will typically decrease by, let's say, a million dollars, and, and overall long-term value is created for the other company shareholders. Any other advantage before? Tell me the, the greatest disadvantage or greatest risk of hedge funds. Well, the, the hedge funds uh, do take positions uh, in the, particularly in the derivatives mar market and particularly using leverage, uh, which create tremendous risks. Uh, and uh, it, it may be that one hedge fund would be in a position to, to create a calamity in the market or maybe may be the aggregation of a number of hedge fund positions um, might cause problems. Anybody add something to that? Well, I would add one more. Yeah. And as when they begin to sell in times of stress, they do cause dislocations in the market in terms of asset sales and stock sales. I, I represent, at least until the end of this uh, next month, the, the, the largest concentration of hedge funds, I think, in the world, in the Fairfield County, New York area. In other words, they either sleep in the district and work in New York or they actually work in the district as well. And their argument to me constantly was, you know, these folks know what they're doing. Uh, they've got the, the money, you know, to risk and they know what they're doing. They're, they're wise investors and they would suggest, you know, large, you know, uh, or, you know, universities and so on who know the risk. Um, and, and never then was it discussed that, you know, they could bring that, in a sense, Wall Street could bring down Main Street. Was it obvious to all of you uh, in the last five or six years that, that we were going to encounter what we're encountering now? I'd like to ask each of you. Let me start backwards. Ms. Chavez. Yeah. Yes, because it, the housing prices could not um, keep going up forever. But this so. was obvious to you that we would be dealing with the kind of mess we're in right now? Not, not necessarily the extent of it, no. Okay. Well, I'm just a tax guy, so I'm going to pass to, <laughs> to Professor Lowe. You're just a coward. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I guess I might not use the word obvious, but uh, starting in 2004, I published a series of papers highlighting the fact that there was growing indirect evidence that a dislocation uh, in the hedge fund industry was, uh, was building. And so certainly the indirect evidence seemed to show that that was the case. Uh, in 1998, I testified before the House Banking Committee suggesting that there be the kind of uh, information disclosure I've suggested today so that 10 years ago I was concerned right. about this problem of uh, opacity in this market. Yeah. Uh, well, part I, of my that question for asking is uh, good for you. And, uh, you know, sometimes we don't notice the people who were uh, out in front uh, years ago uh, making this, attempting to make this point heard. Uh, head of Lehman Brothers, Dick F uh, Fold, in a hearing before this committee, laid a large deal of blame for Lehman's collapse on hedge funds shorting the stock. Would any of you care to comment on that? I think that's sort of reversing the cause and effect. Uh, uh, prominent hedge fund manager David Einhorn back in March of uh, this year, he, he called out Lehman Brothers' financial statements and saying, wait a second, you're not being fully disclosing all your risks with investors. He sold the stock short. So it was really, I think, uh, the problem was Lehman Brothers, not the short sellers. They attracted the short sellers because of their financial mismanagement. So the bottom line is you don't agree? Correct. Okay. I would say don't kill the messenger. Okay. And I don't know. Don't kill the messenger. Who is the messenger? <laughs> the messenger in the sense of the short sellers that are trying to get okay. the message across that a company is overvalued. Um, I I if we, uh, is it necessary to increase regulation on hedge funds or would creating an exchange for der derivatives trading be sufficient? Uh, I think the creation of a, uh, of, uh, of standardized derivative contracts and a, uh, and this, this clearing and settlement and, and and exchange trading would be a very fine step in the right direction. We've also had, and we are having today, steps towards creating a clearance and settlement uh, platform for uh, derivative contracts. I think that's a very good step in the right direction to overcome the opacity and counterparty risk problems we have. Uh, I agree, but I don't think that we know whether or not it would be sufficient. I think that goes too far to push all derivatives um, onto a um, centralized exchange. I think the only problems we've had with credit default swaps is really their involvement with insurance companies and monoline insurers, not the typical derivatives trader. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Thank you, Mr. Shays. All uh, members having asked uh, questions, I want to thank this panel for your testimony. It's been very helpful to us, and we appreciate your being here. Uh, we're going to take a five-minute recess uh, while we uh, uh, seat the next panel. So we'll be reconvened in five minutes. So about a five-minute break in this uh, hearing on turmoil in the financial markets. We'll come back in five minutes. And in the meantime, a look at uh, some political news from this morning's Washington Journal. The election stands right now with a couple of races still outstanding. There are 50 new members of Congress and eight new senators. And here's some information.